This is the story of a murderer. The story of a tyrant, of a blood-soaked psychopath. But it's also the story of a man of honour, of pride, family and of courage. This is the story of the man who would become the monster Corgus Cool. Hello friends, Smotown here and today we are looking at more Age of Sigmar lore and to me one of the most fascinating characters within the setting. In the Age of Sigmar we encounter countless heroes and villains but very few characters, in my opinion, cast the same shadow as the mighty Corgus Cool. Blessed with immortality and strength by his patron, Korn, Corgus was easily a match for any of the immortal Stormcast Eternals. Known as the Bane of Akshay, Cool was known for his savagery and cruelty. He even attempted to build a pyramid of a million skulls to honour the blood god that he served. This is a man who would eat the flesh of his own men to rejuvenate himself and slaughter hundreds of them just to summon an army of demons to hurtle at his enemies. Yet for all that, Corgus was once a normal man, with a family, loyalties and friends. The depravity of Corgus Cool after this only adds to the drama and the tragedy of this fall of this great man to a flesh-eating servant of Corn. It is a story that we have seen so many times in other fiction before. A good man has his beliefs and loved ones leveraged against him and so he sees his power to try and save them before getting lost and forgetting his original purpose and becoming the thing he once vowed to defend his family against. Corgus is then hollowed out, swollen with power, rage and cruelty, until nothing is left of the once good man. This is the story of one man's journey and fall to the power of chaos, and it is really one of the best stories told within the Age of Sigmar setting. The prehistory of this character, Corgus Cool, is told in the book, the Black Library novel, The Red Feast, and for the purposes of this video, we will be discussing Corgus's full fall to chaos, and therefore there will be major spoilers for the entire book. It's another great Black Library novel, and I recommend that you read it before watching this video, because there are going to be spoilers, you have been warned. The story is set in the Age of Myth, just before the Age of Chaos broke out. We see that Corgus was once a man who was part of a warrior tribe known as the Cool, and his name was Athol, so therefore Athol Cool. The Cool tribe was very Spartan, taking extraordinary little luxuries, living simply, and training for war every day. Martial prowess was held in the highest regard in this tribe. Athol had a wife and child, and he was one of the leading members of the tribe, known as the Spear Carrier, because he literally carried a spear, and because he played an important role in the diplomatic relations of his tribe. His tribe had allied with a wealthier tribe known as the Ridians some generations ago. Both are one of the many tribes of the Flame Scar Plateau, and both are nomadic, so they moved their tent city together from one location to another. This was a decision for mutual benefit and survival. The Cool would provide their blades as protection, while the Iridians would provide food and economy. Athol's role as spear carrier was twofold. First is to act as champion for the prophet queen of the Iridians, where he often fights on her behalf during trials by combat when necessary. Secondly, and most likely more, more critical, he acts as a bridge between the two peoples, speaking for the Cool in the court of the Prophet Queen and relaying the wishes of the Iridians to the Cool people. Yet the years of peace between the two have started to grate on the peoples of the Cool. The peoples of the Cool are meant for war. They are a martial society. Agitation and tension is growing between the two cultures. Athel is known amongst his people as unusually controlled for the Cool, having ice in his veins but in reality a fire has been stoked within him, from the threat that the discord between the two tribes could cause his wife and child, and the insults he suffers from the haughty Iridian court. Athel and his clan are the perfect targets for Corn, the blood god. And Corn, like the other chaos gods at this point, is looking for a way into the mortal realms, and they therefore look at the occupants of these worlds and try and corrupt them for their own means. Athel is portrayed in a sympathetic light. He is a man of honour, a man with a code, and he's extremely skilled in battle who cares deeply for his family and serves his queen with honour. However, the stress of his situation and his martial way of life means that he is slowly corrupted by the blood god. The Corn Bloodbound Battle Tome explains this relationship between martial societies and Corn very succinctly, for it says, It was during the age of myth that men first became corrupted by the chaos gods. It began slowly for those who would become dedicated to Corn. The values of the most aggressive and warlike cultures began to twist until they saw war not as a means to an end, but rather as a way of life. In addition, unbeknownst to the Cool, they have already got an existing relationship with the Blood God in their long, distant, forgotten past. 
they indeed possess an artifact amongst their camp, known as the Last Forge, a skull-covered forge that produces powerful blessed weapons, as long as it is fed a steady stream of blood as its fuel. While the cool have forgotten the significance and patron of this forge, to the reader it is clear that Korn's hand is behind such a fearsome device that is fed by blood. We learn more about the tribe's forgotten past later when we meet another character, but I'll discuss that later on in the video. These tensions come to a head in the Iridian court at the arrival of a being who comes from a race of people known as the Tithe Masters, and Korn looks to Athol, seeing him as his ticket into the mortal realm at this moment. For the Tithe Masters are actually puppets of his brother god Zinch, and Korn sees Athol as his mortal champion to be set against the champions of Zinch. While this is not explicitly said in the book, Korn does explain that these are the agents of his brother God, and that they see Korn's power in Athol. The Tithe Master comes to Iridian after one of his agents are detained by the Iridian court, who didn't realise he is one of their agents, as he was caught stealing some of the Crown's livestock. The agent is then tried, and Athol defeats his champion in a trial by combat. Not long after, an imposing Tithe Master appears in the court, and Zinch's hand is very clear to the reader. He is a master of sorcery, this Tithe Master. He has bird-like arms and claws, and has a glowing blue eye. The Tithe Masters seem to be a group of Batari renegades, who reputedly live in a floating castle, and hold the people of the plateau to ransom, demanding annual tithes from each culture, under threat of attack from their floating palace. The Tithe Master claims this thief was actually just taking their allotted tithe from the Iridians, which they were not aware of and as recompense for humiliating his champion and agent, they will take double, but not only this, they will take hostages, including the Queen's champion, Athel himself. The Tithe Master threatens the Queen, commands her to stay quiet, and generally humiliates and bullies her. Athel does not take kindly to these threats, and informs the Tithe Master that if he does not leave, he will kill him. A fight then ensues where Athel kills the Tithe Master's agent, and then he must fight off the Tithe Master himself. This fight shakes Athel because the Tithe Master possesses power far beyond what he has witnessed up to this point. There's never been an enemy Athel has not been able to defeat, yet he is close to death a number of times during this fight because of the sorceries of the Tithe Master and his terribly powerful claws. However, he in turn stuns the mage with his weapon which is able to deflect and cut through his magic and therefore cause him harm. This already hints that the Chaos Gods are pitting their agents against each other and the Tithe Master senses something else behind Athel. The Tithe Master obviously had not been expected to face a weapon which had been blessed by another god, a god who despises magic and whose gifts are often created to counter such tricks. Athel manages to drive off the Tithe Master who turns into mist and escapes, but the court is split on what has happened. The Queen's half-brother and the Queen herself lean toward Athel's plan of defiance, whereas her lawmaker and other nobles are terrified of the consequences and argue that Athel should be surrendered along with compensation as well as denouncing Athol's actions and defending the Queen. This is really the moment when Athol's fury begins to manifest, breaking his cool demeanour. He despises the Tithe Masters, calling them filthy, and despises the weakness and duplicity within the court of Iridian. Surrender is absolutely no option to someone like him. They must stand and fight against these sorcerers. His valiant stand to defend his Queen again highlights that he's a man of honour and a man of a code, but things are changing. He saw something more in the Tithe Master that goes beyond what he has normally experienced. He wishes to protect his family, his clan, and his honour, and this is something we can all sympathise with. However, it does make him vulnerable and desperate. A clearly troubled Athel then goes to sleep and has a fever stream where he is visited by the Blood God himself, and so begins the Blood God's corruption of Athel. The dream segment reads as follows. He staggered into a clearing and found himself standing before an imaginably high mountain. As his vision cleared, he saw that the mount was not of rock, but bone, a towering monument of skulls heaped upon each other. The, dr the dream goes into far more detail, but symbolically, Korn is offering Athel the power and strength to defeat his enemies, preying on his martial prowess and desire to defend his family through combat. After discussing it with his tribe, family and the queen, it is agreed that Athel will go and search for allies amongst the other tribes of the plateau to gather a coalition to resist the Tithe Masters. However, his wife and child are taken hostage by the Iridians to make sure Athel keeps his side of the Alliance, again making his situation more precarious. However, when Athel sets out, he does not seek out the other tribes, but instead he seeks out the power that was promised to him in his dream. He is like a man possessed, 
not sure what he's looking for or what he's doing, but he's absolutely sure that this is the key to his victory. This moment in the story is a really interesting shift in his character, as he's usually a level-headed man who's very calm and keeps to the plan. Yet now he is clearly desperate, fearing for his clan and families. Seeing the power of the Tithe Masters, he must seize power of his own. The Iridians are pressuring him and threatening his wife, so he must too find power. In this hunt, he comes to a mountain that resembles the Mountain of Skulls from his dream in shape. Upon nearing the summit, he is stopped by a herd of gores, who are going to attack him, but they are in turn scared off by an old man. It turns out that this man is a messenger of corn, who was once of the cool himself, generations ago, and speaks the ancient tongue of the cool. He tells Athel of a blood spirit, and the spirit knows of Athel, and that he has chosen him to be his champion. This man's name is Lashkar, and he implies that the cool even served this blood spirit in the world that was, before the end times, and that now the cool begin to forget their roots, polluted by the lies of the Hammer God. This explains the Cool's martial spirit, society, their forge and their weapons if they carried this over from the world that was. This man, Lashkar, takes Athel to a holy place upon the summit where Korn's sigil is drawn and, using a blood sacrifice of a bulgore, Athel sacrifices his first skull to the Blood God. At this moment the ground splits open and Lashkar is covered in blood and becomes the mouth of Korn, who speaks through Lashkar. Through some hidden memory of his people, or by Korn's power himself, Athel finally recognises the blood spirit's true name, Korn. Korn offers Kul the blood of his enemies, in exchange for his eternal service and soul. Thinking of the Tithe Masters and his people, Athel accepts, and the exchange goes as follows. I will not trick you. You will surrender to me, and I will give you the power you need to defeat your foes, all foes. But you shall be mine. I shall be in you. Every victory you win will be my victory, Athel says in response, I pledge myself to you. With my blood I seal this pact, my life is yours, my soul is yours. A phrase came to him, unknown until now, like the name of the power to which he swore. Blood for the blood god. Lashkar is also rewarded for his part in bringing Athel to the top of the summit, and his return to his athletic and warrior form of years past when he was a young member of the cool. As a priest of Korn, he tells Athel that he is to be renamed, a name of the old cool leaders of the past, Corgus, therefore Corgus Cool, and so his fall from grace has truly begun. Relaying the word of Korn, Lashkar tells Cool that an opportunity has risen, where Corgus can build an army against the Tithe Masters. An event called the Red Feast has been called on the Clavis Isles, where the tribes of the Flamescar come and gather and settle old scores through duels and discussions. We then come to the titular event of the book, which is honestly one of my favourite scenes in all of Age of Sigmar. The Red Feast. Instead of it being an organised and lawful affair where things are settled legally and through duels, Cool stops the anger of leaders and clans who are fed up of the so called Sigmar tongues and those who worship the Hammer God, who are crushing their warlike ways of the past. Chief among his new allies is Threx Skullbrand, who is the one that actually called the Red Feast. This will be a familiar character for some, as he will go on and become Cool's Blood Secretor who features in the Realm Gate Wars series. Thule tries to turn the feast into a martial contest, and whoever wins will lead an army, and he will lead them against the Tithe Masters. However, a spokesman from the Direbrand tribe, when loyal to Sigmar, denounce his plans and turn his back on him, essentially shaming him. This is the same tribe who Kul would later exterminate to earn Grizzlemaw, and the tribe that Vandis Hammerhand would actually come from. So begins the bloodbath. Kul and his allies turn the feast into a bloody slaughter, slaying the dire brands and others, whilst encouraging others to join the slaughter. Heads and bodies are piled high in honour of corn. It's a visceral and dizzying scene where everyone just seems to be possessed by bloodlust, murdering their family and kin. It's a nightmare scene that really needs to be read to experience, and it's absolutely incredible, and again, I can't highly recommend this book enough. It marks corn's entry into the mortal realms with this slaughter. Corgus and Lashgar get their new allies to dedicate themselves to Korn, and anyone who resists is slaughtered and added to the pile of the dead. In tandem, Kul announces that champions who wish to claim Korn's favour, him included, must climb to the top of a mountain, claim the goblet of blood that lies at the top, and kill all the rivals on the way up. The last one standing will be Korn's favoured. Kul, after slaughtering hundreds of champions, is of course the last standing and makes it all the way to the summit. 8 is Korn's holy number, and 888 is the number of champions who are killed in Korn's name during this competition. The sky is ripped asunder, 
and the demons of Corn finally rip into reality, the first demons on the mortal realm. Corgus has his army and his god's favour. And that's the first book of Corgus Cool's origin stories. I'm uh, unsure if we'll get any more, but to be honest, even if it just stays at that, we've learned a lot about the man who would one day become the absolute monster who terrorised the mortal realms. What I like about this book is that despite being so far re removed from a normal human now, Corgus Cool, he's just so cruel and so demonic. He started out as someone who was just normal and had, you know, very human aspirations and very sympathetic in a lot of ways, just wanted to protect his family. It's pretty hard to watch this transformation of Athol to Corgus, because Athol himself is actually a good man, a man with code and courage, yet this is warped and twisted by Corn, and blackened. In his desperation to save all he loves, he gets lost in the power he's granted, and his pact to the god, until he's replaced by the beast known as Corgus Cool, and forgets all about the man known as Athol. For this reason I really love this story, it's similar to Abaddon's origin story in the Talon of Horus. Um, but that's it for now guys, that's my take on the rise of Corgus Cool, uh, what I see is one of the best stories in the Age of Sigmar. If you like this video, uh, please don't hesitate to like and subscribe, leave your comments below about this uh, really interesting character. And if you like Age of Sigmar lore, please uh, subscribe because I will be doing more. Um, but for now, have a nice night.